Hello, everyone. My name is Valia Mitsakis, and I'm a senior at New York University. Um, I'm studying politics and media culture and communication, and I'm going to be the moderator of today's panel. I got interested in youth issues when I represented a organization at the United Nations. Um, its name is Paco, and it, fo it focused and still focuses on youth empowerment and uh, women's issues. Um, so the past couple of years, um, we have seen more and more uh, young people fighting for what they believe in, from gun control to the Me Too movement to Black Lives Matter. Um, we have seen youth try to influence the decision-making processes of their communities and the nation. Um, for this reason, we here at DC Dialogues decided to bring some activists to speak to all of you about ways that you can bring about change in your individual communities. So today, I have the pleasure to introduce three young change makers um, who have brought about change, not just in their communities, but all around the country and the world. Um, Anika Manzoor um, is the executive director of the Youth Activism Project. She co-founded uh, the Youth Activism Project's very first campaign, School Girls Unite, at the age of 12, which among others successfully lobbied for $200 million a $200 million increase in Ford Aid for Education. Next to her is Haley Quinn, uh, who is an NYU graduate, um, who now works for the International Brotherhood of Te Teamsters. While in college, she led the organizing drive, resulting in the first intern union in the country, and began organizing with the Student Labor Action Movement at NYU for a $15 uh, minimum wage. Um, and last but not least, um, Carlos Mark Vera, who is the founder of Pay Our Interns, a nonprofit organization that advocates uh, for more paid inter internships and, and workforce development opportunities for millennials. Um, in just one year, Pay Our Interns successfully persuaded a dozen members of Congress, several nonprofits, and political advocacy groups to offer paid internships. Its efforts motivated Congress to designate nearly $14 million to create over 4,000 paid internships on Capitol Hill. And as a Capitol Hill intern, I'm eternal, eternally grateful to you. <laughs> um, so let's just begin um, with you introducing yourselves and telling us what you're doing now um, in your positions. Um, and then I'll continue with some questions. And towards the end, we'll open it for questions um, for all of you to you know, ask what you want to find out from these amazing change makers. So want to start from you? Oh, sure. Mark? Yeah. So um, I'm really glad to be here. And uh, to kind of answer your question, for us now, we just got Congress appropriate $14 million. It's going to be hitting uh, offices in like a month or two. So for anyone that's looking for paid internships, this is the perfect time to do it. So for us, our, our challenge for paid interns now is the reason why we fought for this funding was um, because it's an issue for working class youth, people of color. They simply can't afford unpaid internships. On average, an internship can cost up to $6,000 a year. Um, and just most American families don't have that money. So our challenge now is how do, can we recruit uh, working class youth from across the country for these paid opportunities? Uh, because what we're going to see now is offices tell their donors, not only can I get your son or daughter an internship, now I can pay them for it. You know, and that's problematic. And of course, you know, people with money are always going to have some way to get into positions of power. That's not going to change. But it's kind of like, how can we get, you know, more people that look like the American society in the halls of government? Because that's a big issue. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what we're doing right now. And then fundraising to expand pay our interns. Because when I started this, I was a server full time, which is like the most millennial th thing ever. So yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so right now, I am on kind of the, the behind the scenes back end of the movement. So I do strategic research for a union, which basically means that I dig up dirt on companies, um, make the case that they should pay their workers more, make the case that their CEO is getting paid too much, you know, whatever, make the case that their workhouses aren't safe. Um, that, that's what I do now, um, which is a change from what I was doing in college. Um, in college, I did a lot more on the organizing side, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. Um, but you know, I graduated, and I wanted to have time for a dog. <laughs> so <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm a little bit more behind the scenes now, and I'm really happy doing that. Um, 
And, and one of the things that's going to be a theme of stuff that I talk about is that there's a lot of work to be done that isn't the, the organizing, that isn't like out in the field. That's the behind the scenes research stuff. That's the fundraising stuff. That's the writing grants and the making sure the payroll is done, um, kind of like the unsexy parts of activism um, that still need to get done. Um, so I'm doing kind of the unsexy parts now, but I think it's sexy and fun. So <laughs> I would really recommend strategic research and unions. And that's what I'm doing now. Cool. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so as the executive director of the Youth Activism Project, um, what I'm focusing on right now is growing our nonprofit, which has been a volunteer-run nonprofit for a while. When I co-founded it when I was 12, um, and I can probably talk about that later. Um, and um, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to um, empower young people with the networks, resources, and skills to be able to uh, create change in their communities and actually meet with decision makers and, um, and kind of simplify the process of civic engagement because I think what's critical um, is the fact that um, a, young people are globally are unengaged, and we can see this in like low voter uh, um, voter rates around the world. We could see this with young people saying that you know one of their biggest concerns is not being able to meet with decision makers, um, and so uh, and and we also see this um, in um, as, as a civic. Uh, Civic empowerment gap, which is a, a term coined by um, Mira Levinson, who is at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And that is um, essentially kind of like the um, academic achievement gap, where richer um, or more well-off students, um, starting as early as fourth grade, know more about um, the civic engagement process. And, and those power structures are a little bit more accessible to them than people from marginalized backgrounds. So what we're trying to do at the Youth Activism Project is um, really um, making, we're really trying to lower the barrier of entry to these processes, uh, specifically focusing on making resources that are accessible for young people. Um, and when we say young people, we mean um, adolescents, 12 to 18. OK, so um, now let's talk a little bit about how you got to be where you are, how you started, because you all started from a very young age. I know you started at the age of 12, which is amazing. Um, and the rest of you started in high school or college. So would you mind sort of commenting about how you all started, how you became passionate about what you became passionate about, and uh, how you built your careers to are where you are today? So people ask that all the time, like, and she's like, oh, what like inspired you to do this? And I'm like, well, life experience. <laughs> I, I was an unpaid intern on the Hill and um, coming from a low income family. So I went to school at American University in DC, but I'm from California. I, I couldn't ask my parents for money, uh, but of course I wanted to intern because like, if you want to get a job, you have to have experience. So what I did is I basically interned about 28 hours a week. Uh, I worked on the side, but another 20 hours, and then I took 16 college credits as a 17 year old. So like, as opposed to like enjoying my um, internship, I was basically fighting to not fall asleep. And I guess for me, like the most, um, I don't know, just the moment I really remember the most is like, you know, walking down the hallways of Congress and realizing that no one looked like me except the janitors um, and being like, these are the people that are supposed to write our laws that impact all our communities. Um, and then I did a lot of uh, other unpaid internships. I did one at the European Parliament and then I did one at the White House. So basically it was, me going through the, the, um, the internships. I guess what made me start it was um, after finishing at AU, I was working for Van Jones, and I kind of really kept on thinking about the fact that I was like, okay, the job market has changed. Like, you have to intern nowadays to get a job. Like, that's just the reality. And that wasn't always the case. But because the majority of uh, internships aren't paid in like certain sectors, like the fashion world in New York City, um, journalism, like Harper's Magazine was just, uh, advertising on paid internship in Manhattan. I don't know who could live there for free in Manhattan. Um, obviously, public sector. It really is leaving a lot of folks, and no one's really doing anything about it. So I said, screw it. You know, I'm not going to wait until decision makers wake up one day and say, you know what, this is a problem that we need to fix. So I quit my job, at much to the displeasure of my parents, <laughs> <laughs> and I started pay our interns. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, so I guess I got my start. I grew up in a small town in the middle of Missouri. Um, I'm from a, a working class Irish Catholic family. Um, unions were big in my household. My dad went to college because my grandpa was a teamster. Um, so I knew that like unions were important growing up. I saw 
you know, firsthand the effects that the recession had on my family and on my community. And I was also really aware that I had two college educated parents because I had two grandfathers who were union members. And uh, because I had two college educated parents, I was able to um, have opportunities that other kids in my community didn't have. Um, but there was never, you know, a lot of money. There's never a lot of resources. Um, there was one public high school in my town, and that's where we all went. And there were, I went to school with a lot of kids who honestly worked harder than me and were smarter than me and didn't have the same opportunities. And so I get to do stuff like this and they don't. And so I was, I really feel the weight of that unfairness all the time. Um, and I know that there are people who I am smarter than and work harder than that are in positions of power that I don't have access to because I didn't have access to the same generational wealth that they did. Um, so that's sort of the background that I came from. Um, when I started working, it was at, a, at an internship at the American Federation of Teachers here in DC, which is a teachers union that represents, I think they call it 1.6 million members and counting. Um, and uh, the work that I did there was really important and meaningful in terms of like the actual job, but the most important part of that internship for me was when we unionized, which is, I'm excited to meet Carlos, we should have met years ago, <laughs> talking about intern stuff. Um, but so we were going to Fight for 15 rallies. Um, we were part of a union that was part of the Fight for 15, and we were getting paid $12 an hour. And you know that felt like a fundamental incompatibility. Um, and that's an issue with a lot of you know progressive organizations, progressive nonprofits, and unions, who you know talk about the importance of a fair wage, who talk about the importance of work-life balance, but then don't apply that to their own staff. So um, a group of a few interns saw that as an opportunity to get some press and to also get a union contract. Um, so we organized what ended up being the first intern union in the country, um, which in reality was just a group of six people who went to happy hour and like had a lot of conversations with our coworkers. Um, so it was this big national thing, but really what it came down to was just us having conversations with our coworkers about what their needs were, about what our needs were, about what change we could affect in the workplace with the resources that we had access to. Um, and then I also ended up organizing in college with the Student Labor Action Movement. Um, we did a 15 on campus campaign. I think it's this academic year they're phasing in 15 an hour. So you're welcome. <laughs> um, uh, no, it was the work, um, a long, long campaign of a lot of activists. Um, as is the case with most things, you know, um, higher ups, people in power would probably claim credit for having done it, but it's the work of a lot of activists. Um, yeah, so that's great, and that's sort of where I came from and why I do what I do. Um, so I often say that I was an accidental activist. I know it sounds really impressive that I started when I was 12, but I was not really an impressive 12-year-old. Um, I was pretty nerdy and quite timid, watched a lot of Disney Channel and read a lot of Harry Potter, um, and j like, my friend called me one day on our home phone, back when landlines were a thing, and um, said, hey, um, there's this woman who's actually in the audience today um, who wants to uh, gather a group of girls and talk about the issue of girls' education um, in the developing world. And um, she'd mentioned like Bangladesh was on the list of, of these countries, and my family's from Bangladesh, and so I was mildly interested um, and went to this session um, and listened to harrowing statistics such as 100 million girls around the world are denied an education and I was like, wow, that's really bad. But I don't think I would have done anything if I didn't receive an invitation to do something about it. And I think that is critical. I think most young people, um, when you look at the studies, most young people um, are engaged when someone gives them the opportunity. Um, you hear a lot of stories of young people taking the initiative, and you know they're good for them. They're awesome that they have that that they know that that they have the power to do something. But I didn't know I had the power to do anything until an adult signaled that for me. Um, and 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 then so I said, you know, yes, let's let's um, do something about this issue. And um, my friend said yes as well, and we created School Girls Unite. Um, that as 12 year olds, that um, is a name that we came up with. Uh, and um, and it, so it was really youth led. It was, a, it was a youth led movement where we would fundraise um, and we fundraised thousands of dollars 
um, in, in like we fundraised like $10,000 in like two years or something like that for girls uh, scholarships in Mali. And we also, um, every day we would um, go to um, Capitol Hill and lobby for, as you said, um, increased funding for education. Um, and that was incredibly empowering as someone who couldn't vote. And I carried that with me for the rest of my life. It made me um, major in gender studies in college. Um, I started, after I graduated, started working in youth empowerment and education around the world. Um, and eventually came back, Still, I was still loosely involved with Youth Activism Project. And as I was really thinking about what do I want to do for my career, I want to pay forward my experience to other young people who just don't know that they can actually do something to make the world a better, a better place. So that's why I'm, I'm still with the Youth Activism Project. Okay, just to clarify, that is indeed impressive. <laughs> that's a 12-year-old. Um, I think at that point, I was too watching a lot of Harry Potter and Disney Channel, but I was not uh, at, at having my own Same. initiative. Um, but I think that you did mention something very important, that we do, it's not just us doing it alone, and if it is, that is fine, but it's also important to have mentors and role models that will help us through the process, um, or we should have more, and there should be this intergenerational dialogue. Um, so the next question uh, from me to you is, have you had any mentors or role models um, that you've had in your life that helped you throughout this process? And have you perhaps been a mentor uh, to younger people? And we can yeah, um, and so again, shout out to Wendy Lesko in the audience, who's the, the founder and my co-conspirator in, um, in growing the Youth Activism Project. She is, um, I think, my first, I wouldn't say first real mentor, I had a lot of great teachers, but I mean, Wendy really helped me discover the power of my voice, and that's because she treated me like a human being and not necessarily a young, she treated me like an equal. And she, I very distinctly remember when she did this sort of dialogue about girls' education, she asked us all if we wanted to be architects to address this injustice. And I was like, who, who talks like that to young people? <laughs> um, I'm in, okay, great. Like, um, and so, so Wendy, to me, really embodied the, the kind of allyship from adults that um, we want to um, share with other adults and, 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 and that kind of partner, like it is possible to collaborate with young people um, as long as you're letting them be the real leaders of the change that they wanna make. I mean, I think that's key because young people are capable of so much. And we, I mean, I think we all know that young people are typically at the forefront of any social change movement because they're creative and um, they think outside the box and they're not as confined with like adult, like, you know, jadedness or whatnot, right? So, um, so Wendy was a great role model for me. And now as I'm an adult with the Youth Activism Project, I try to kind of aspire to, to that kind of allyship, right? Um, and I, um, and it's, it's so great to be on the other side because um, it, it's, just, it's like full circle, I guess. So I feel like I've talked a lot, so I'll let you guys answer. <laughs> totally fine, don't be afraid to take up space. Um, yeah, I had a lot of really great mentors um, in my life and my career. Um, honestly, I think my biggest mentors were my coworkers who I organized with when I was at AFT. I've had a lot of really great professional mentors, but in terms of activism, um, I was the, the youngest in that group. I was the only one who couldn't drink, so I had iced tea at happy hour. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> yeah, um, that bar did card. Um, <laughs> But yeah, um, the other people I was organizing with, because they also like treated me like an equal and like I was a, an adult. You know, I was organizing with people who were, you know, in their late twenties, early thirties, and they treated me like I had the same rights as they did, like I had the same voice as they did. Um, and when I doubted myself, they really gave me the opportunity to to step up and do stuff. So the first time we had a big meeting where we were like introducing some demands. Um, I had not been on the forefront of this organizing committee. And they said, Haley, why don't you, why don't you read this? And I was like, oh, I don't know, like, should I? I mean, I don't have a fear of public speaking, really, but I, I didn't feel qualified to do it. And having somebody who I saw as qualified tell me, no, you are qualified to do it. Mm -hmm. Like, right now, you're qualified. You don't have to like take a class to be qualified to do it. You don't have to run X campaigns to be qualified to speak about things that are important to you and things that affect you. Um, so I really 
think of them as my mentors in that way. And I hope, I think in the same way I was able to do the same. Um, I didn't really start organizing in college until my senior year, so I was doing a lot of work um, with you know like freshmen and sophomores coming up through the ranks of student activism. Um, and really just giving them the same thing where I just said to them, you know, they would come up to me and be like, can you help me like do this petition? Can you, what's the right way for me to do this? Like, how do I talk to somebody? And just letting them know, you actually already know how to do this. Um, a lot of organizing, I mean, it does take practice. Some organizing isn't intuitive, but a lot of organizing is intuitive. Like you probably know how to have an organizing conversation, whether or not you've been in a training about how to have an organizing conversation. Like you know how to listen to a friend talk about the things that affect their lives and how to help offer them solutions. And that's what an organizing conversation is. Um, so I think in the same way as that other people mentored me by just telling me that I was actually already qualified to speak on my own experience, I've tried to mentor people in that same way. Of like, you are the expert on your own experience. You are the expert on this campaign that you're helping to run. You can talk about it. Um, so that's the way I see mentorship. Um, <clears throat> for me, in college, uh, because I've been given so many opportunities in terms of like having scholarships, having support for me, like my whole goal is like, how do you pay it forward and make sure that it's a little bit easier for people behind you um, so even when I was like as a sophomore in college, I was a peer mentor. So like I would help incoming freshmen of color, African American, Latinos, first gen, like help them um, acclimate into American University. So that was just something that came to me naturally, just like how can you help people? And um, for me, it's like the way I see life is how can you thrive as entire society and community, and not just one person? Um, because without going on a rant, sometimes that's what you see in communities of color the whole crab mentality that if, you know, if you're thriving, it's hurting me and vice versa. So it's like, how can you all float up together? Um, for me, actually, I had a, a really good mentor in my internship on the Hill. People in my office were not that nice, <laughs> being blunt, besides one. But there was the, the fellow there who was a professor at Howard University, we would get lunch together. And he, I think he, uh, one lesson he always taught me is like, you only need, you only need to know three things in life how to add and subtract, <laughs> how to communicate, and how to work as a team. And I've used those skills in pretty much everything I've done. You know, um, and then I had professors that were very helpful for me. Um, I, I rarely ever saw it where you talk to somebody like, I choose you as my mentor. It was just kind of something that just became natural. Um, one advice I would give people is also find people that will like call you out on your BS. Um, because it makes nothing, makes nothing good to go to your mentor and be like, oh my god, you're amazing, you're doing well. Uh, and you may be doing really well, but there are also points of growth. Um, so like through this, pro through this process of parenting, yeah, I've had a lot of success, but I've also had done things that needed to have done better. And because sometimes I just people being like, oh my god, this is great. Like you'll have a meeting with a certain person that could give you money and everything. They're not there to root for you, to be honest with you. So like it's better to have a circle of people not in a negative way, but in a constructive way, be like, I think you can do this better, you can do this uh, better organizing technique or tactic um, so that you can grow. Because um, I think that's something that's very important. And sometimes I do see it among sometimes some of my, my peers that are very successful. They're like, okay, well, I know it all. And it's like, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Feedback is important. I, I do believe that. And it's Constructive tough. Constructive feedback. Yes, 100%. Yeah. It's so tough. Like when people tell me, can I just be honest with you? And you're like, yeah, but it's like immediately you're just like, oh. <laughs> You're like ready to rebut, right? Yeah. Not too I mean, honest. That's true. It's like, ah, oh, really? Uh, you want to talk like yeah. this right now? Yes, I understand. Yeah, but it, it's very important. And two things are important. I would say that learning from your mistakes is really important. Or like having people who have gone through the things that you have gone through mm -hmm. to tell you, look, yes, you're great at this, but you could bet you become a little better at that. And that's how you know spaces are created for young people. And that's how um, young people can believe that they can bring about change. Uh, because it is difficult when you have an entire federal government, right? It's sometimes, and you're an intern and you have to answer calls. Yeah. That is the first thing that you do as an intern on the Hill. Your impact might seem quite small, but when you start having a community of young people who yeah. really want to bring about change like you do, perhaps your voice gets magnified. And that's where the, my next question is, you know, it is sometimes difficult for young people to get their voices heard. Um, Many times there is no space for them in governments, not just here, but around the world. Um, and some governments are trying to implement youth councils. 
et cetera, to, to increase youth participation and decision-making processes. But the truth is, it is difficult. So do you have, how did you, you sort of deal with that issue? Um, and are there any tips that you would give to young people who are trying to become activists but are also afraid that you know, their voice won't be heard or um, they don't, like you said before, they do not necessarily think that they have the expertise and they do need someone to tell them that they do but they don't have that mentor in their life that would do it. So what are some of the experiences you've had um, and any tips that you have to give our audience? Do you wanna start since you guys are 12 year olds? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think one, one thing that I would really love to highlight, and this is something that we tell our um, youth activists that we work with, um, like take, your, take yourself seriously first. Um, and like, you know, you're not just doing a dinky school project, right? You are a legitimate um, organization of individuals who are smart and passionate, um, you know, Call yourself, uh, so that's why the way we frame what we do is we help young people create advocacy campaigns. Oftentimes they're in the form of school clubs, but they're essentially, um, like we want them to not call it a club, like, and create an email address for the initiative that you're trying to, to fight for. Um, and and uh, we provide very concrete tips on how to, how to frame your message when you're meeting with decision makers. Um, do a lot of research on the issue that you are um, trying to fix and include that information uh, in your email to elevate your expertise. Don't say, hey, I'm with the school club and I'm wondering what you think about such and such issue. Say, like, we, under we know that school to prison pipeline is an issue in our community and these are the facts behind it. Um, so that's that's what I would say the biggest way is, is first owning owning your position and and cre creating those kind of formalized um, like communication processes where people can take you seriously. Yeah, totally. Um, my biggest piece of advice to young people looking for a voice to anyone, those of you taking notes, you want to write this down, it's unionize your workplace. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, so unions are important for a great deal of reasons, but they're especially important for young people. Um, young people, so people under, I think the statistic is under like 26, are the most likely demographic to support unions and the least likely demographic to be in a union. Um, and that's for a number of structural reasons. A lot of it's that you know we're being forced into the the gig economy, um, taking jobs that are contract job, not necessarily full time employment. Um, but when you band together, whether it's in a formally recognized union that you know has an election through the National Labor Relations Board, you don't have to go through the formal union process to get together in a group to advocate for yourselves. Um, so I would say you don't have to do it by yourself. Um, whatever issue that you are facing as a young person, there are probably hundreds of other young people facing the same thing um, on your campus, in your dorm, at your workplace, wherever it is, just get together and talk to other people about it. Um, and I think unions are a really powerful way to do that in the workplace. I think we have a lot of power in the workplace that people don't always um, see or recognize for themselves. Um, but yeah, just like figure out what power you do have, because you have more power than you think you do. Um, if you go to NYU, you're a student that pays a lot of tuition um, to a university. So like, you have a stake in that. You have more power than you think you do on your campus and in your workplace. Um, so yeah, you, uh, find the places that you have power and talk to the people around you. Um, and you don't have to do any of it by yourself. So. I forgot to mention, but my like my first like foray into like organizing was at American University. Um, I saw how uh, workers um, like the janitors, um, food workers were being exploited at the university by a third uh, contracting uh, company. But I was not involved with that. I was like an AU ambassador. Like I did tours. I was involved with like this club, that club. So I you know I wasn't in like the student worker rights group, but I saw this as a problem. So what I did is I got involved with the club. I started learning more and more and more about it. Because one thing is like, yes, you want to be a leader, but you can't just go somewhere and immediately start doing things. Like you also have to like be in that space and need to see. Because sometimes more than 
more often than not, people are already doing that type of work, mm -hmm. right? So I think sometimes it's, it's, it's really important to see if there are people doing that work and kind of like joining together. But one is like be authentic, find a platform. So for me, it was Facebook. So I started sharing stories of workers and really like using the power of storytelling. Um, and I started getting followers through that. And then through Facebook, like started a club, started getting followers, because it's like without a, an army, what are you? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's extremely important. So long story short, like at American, like I started a campaign to like raise awareness of work exploitation. Long story short, I was able to create a coalition where we got the entire faculty senate to like go like in favor of this, entire student government, 14 clubs. Long story short, we go over 1,000 people to get on board with this. And we were able to convince the university to create a full ride scholarship for the children of workers. Uh, because if you were a child of a faculty, you went to school, you went to AU for free, if you're a child of a janitor, you had to pay full tuition, um, which is just not equitable at all. Mm -hmm. So there's a little, little, lot of tips here and there. So one is like be authentic, find your audience, find um, your platform, whether that's IG, Twitter, this club, that, um, and then go with it. And 100% like you need to have the confidence. Because especially like, so when I started pay our interns two years ago, I kind of, it was like a white light, but I basically, it was like, we, yeah, like to be blunt, when I was like, okay, I wanna launch this, but I want the media to t care about this. Like, let's be honest here. They don't care about me as a 22 year old. Like, like, who the hell are you, right? So what I did is I called one of my friends who's a state rep that's a millennial, another one that's a, pol and I was like, hey, can you say that the three of us are launching this? And they're like, yeah, for sure. And because they were on the, like, the, um, the list, that is what the media picked up. Mm -hmm. But if it had just been me, it wouldn't have. So that is a tough thing where it's like you're always trying to fight for credibility because of your age. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great, so know your issue, own your issue, like create communities and use those communities and unionize. Those are some great tips. And storytelling, I really storytelling. like that. Yeah. Um, so since you uh, mentioned social media, um, I was wondering whether the rest of you really did see social mo social media like help you uh, throughout the work that you did, uh, because we tend to hear all the time that we live in, in this new era where young people can mobilize a lot easier because of social media, um, and we see a lot of politicians using social media as well. So, has social did social media perhaps transform the way you did uh, your work, and how can young people use it today? Um. Yeah, so social media is a, a great organizing tool. Um, it can't be the only organizing tool, but it is a great organizing tool. So we were, one of the first steps in our campaign for 15 on campus um, was a petition, and we circulated that via a Google form, via Facebook, and that's how we got most of our signatures. Um, so it's a really good way to spread your message quickly, and it's a really good way to get people on board. Um, but for us, I mean, we really saw social media as a way to get people to the, the, the thing, like the actual thing. So get people to the meeting or get people to the rally. Um, there, one downside of social media with organizing is a lot of people RSVP for events that they don't show up to. Um, <laughs> so you have to take that with a little grain of salt. Um, but it is a really good tool for getting the message out there. We didn't use it as much in the intern campaign, but definitely SLAM's campaign. Um, social media was huge for us in that, but it's, it's not a replacement for showing up to meetings and having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people face-to-face -face about the issues. Um, so I have the disadvantage of doing like the brunt of my like on the ground organizing stuff as a pretty young person during a time where social media was just taking off. So we didn't actually, use, I didn't use a lot of social media um, in my organizing, um, during those days, I remember um, we were holding a benefit concert and someone suggested using Twitter because Twitter was just emerging and I was like, this is stupid. <laughs> Why, <laughs> this doesn't seem like it's gonna work. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so I feel like I'm not super well qualified to talk about social media. I feel like a bit of a dinosaur, but um, I will <laughs> I will say that I I really um, with our work we're really trying to get a lot more social media savvy in this day and age because our well because the demographic we're working with is a little bit younger than I, I guess what we're kind of talking about, um, but but. It's, it's incredibly important. I think, I think anyone who is organizing today, um, if they're not using social media in their organizing, they're 
kind of behind, right? Um, and I think one thing that's key about social media is that it's it is actually incredibly important for awareness raising. And I and I saw that in in like my sister, for example, she's eight years younger than me. And a lot of the stuff that she learned through Tumblr, for example, was stuff that I was studying as a gender studies major in college. So I think I think you can't underestimate the power it has just to kind of activate people and spark people. You, but you definitely need to build on that initial spark with, um, with more like face-to-face -face organizing, I think. Would you like to comment on it? Or? Just to kind of, just really quickly, basically, I think social media is really good to disseminate information, to tell like students, be at this place with your picket signs at this time um, and ready to scream. Yeah. But like, it can't be the only tool you're using. But it is a very powerful tool. And I like a lot of times, like when like a worker would be like, um, they would like kick them out or call the cops in there or whatever. Like I'm like breaking, like this just happened, and they would shared like 500 times, and then like you know, so like it it does help. But it's not the only thing. So, yeah. It's it's a great tool to raise 100%. awareness, but you do yeah. need the infrastructure before behind that. And yep. I totally agree. Um, okay, so before we open it to questions from the audience, I would like to ask you about some of the difficulties you faced um, as young people, and also any mistakes that you made um, while you were working in your first years that mm -hmm. now obviously you've learned from. Um, but would you mind commenting on some of the difficulties you faced in the beginning, or you might still be facing? So would you yeah. like to start this time? Sure. Um, <clears throat> like, I, there's a lot of difficulties, I think. I started this when I was 22, I'm 24 now, is, um, so I just went through the process with, for Forbes Center 30, a nomination process, and they were like, is it a benefit or like a disadvantage being young? And I feel like it's both, I feel like it's a disadvantage initially, because when people know your, your age, you just kind of make assumptions, but once you prove yourself, it is actually like um, something okay. powerful, because then people are like, oh, well, you have an interesting perspective, what do you think about this? So I think one was my age. So I, whenever I'm in meetings, like when we took off, I started getting used a lot of like chiefs of staff and like members of Congress, which of course usually they're in their 50s and above. So I don't mention my age ever. Um, second, the disadvantage is um, trying to get funding and access to resources as a young person is much more difficult because they're like, oh well, you don't have 20 years, uh, which is totally understandable, but it doesn't make the cause that I'm fighting for any less important. Mm -hmm. um, so that has, has been an issue a lot. And then the third is just, I guess it's like a whole millennial thing where I was like, okay, I want to do this, but I also like need to pay myself. So like that's why I was a server. And like thankfully, I had enough success that I was able to fundraise enough for myself. Um, but that was definitely an issue. And then in terms of mistakes, like I'm kind of perfect. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, I made a lot of mistakes. I think one was thinking, I mean, I knew I wasn't, I knew this wasn't going to be easy, but it was much more difficult than I thought. And I, I guess it was just kind of like the, I come from politics and organizing, going to the philanthropy and nonprofit world is a whole different beast. Mm -hmm. So like when I started it, I was like, okay, I need a, a 501c3 status to fundraise. Um, you can get a, you can get a, um, not domestic, uh, you can get a fiscal sponsor. So basically you have an organization that kind of like gives you their status, you can fundraise and kind of like incubates you, right? So someone connected me to this foundation that was like progressive, la la la. And they're like, yeah, we'll like, um, you know, give you, we'll fiscally sponsor you, but you need to have a minimum of two hundred fifty thousand dollars in your bank account. And I was just like, yeah. right, like, <laughs> I, I don't even have a four hundred one k. But anyways, I, you know, so I told that person, I was like, I know I can fundraise, but like, it's like the chicken and the egg. I need yeah. that to fundraise, mm -hmm. you know. And they're like, uh, yeah. oh my god, right. it just, yeah. So yeah, so I, I think that was one of the things of like not knowing what I was getting myself into. And then also like a learning experience is like, I grew up poor, so I grew up with little. So when like, I was starting this, I thought big in my campaign, but when it came to fundraising, I thought small because just money was just never something I always had a lot of. Mm -hmm. uh, so that learning process of pushing myself, be like, no, why are you asking for $1,000 when you ask for $50,000? Mm -hmm. So. Um, I'm trying to think if I faced anything sort of specific, I mean, like as a, a woman, as a lesbian in organizing spaces, they're not always like entirely welcoming, but um, that hasn't been a huge issue in my experience. Um, I think a lot of that also comes from like being a white person and like it being easier to move through the world that way. Um, but I think some of the roadblocks that I've run into in my organizing um, 
a big one is burnout of just doing too much too fast all the time um, and just trying to take on too many projects at once. Because um, you get like so excited when you're doing an organizing project. You're like, I'm doing this big thing and I'm going to save the world and everything's going to be great. Um, but then like you don't sleep or um, you forget to write an essay for a class or you know whatever it is. Um, so burnout's a huge thing. Um, but then on the flip side of that, there's also, um, I think I bought into the idea of self-care in a way that wasn't totally productive. So like self-care is important. Um, self-care looks like you know calling your doctor and making sure that your <laughs> prescriptions are up to date and making sure that you have food in your fridge. But it doesn't necessarily look like going to Sephora and getting like $200 worth of makeup to make yourself feel better. Um, so kind of like trying to balance like the real actual need for self-care with like the way that the capitalist society has monopolized on the fact that everybody's burned out and is like, you want to care for yourself? You should buy a $200 facial mask. Like, <laughs> just buy a vegetable. Um, Living my best life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not going to pretend like I didn't buy 10 sheet masks to deal with the Kavanaugh hearings, but I did. Um, but I also bought vegetables. So I would... I just think that like that's important that you you do take care of yourself, but you don't let the idea of taking care of yourself get you carried away and into new problems. Um, and I also think with the idea of taking care of yourself that that gets emphasized so much that we forget about taking care of each other, which like sounds kind of hokey, but is important. Um, being able to take care of your community, but I think the biggest thing is like letting yourself be taken care of. Um, that's still a thing that I'm working on. Um, but I think that that's a skill that you need in activism, but also as a person um, to not just be taking care of other people all the time. But if somebody, you know, if you're sick and somebody offers to bring you soup, or if somebody like offers to take on a task that you're failing at, like be willing to say yes, I do need that help, um, and let people help you. I think that that's one of the biggest lessons that I learned. Um, and also the final thing is because we live in a culture that's like pretty individualistic and really focused on finding like heroes and like individual people and individual narratives. I think a lot of like community efforts get lost in that. Um, so when I did the intern organizing campaign, I mean, it, it did end up that I did, you know, the media stuff for it because of the group, I was the one most comfortable with it. Um, but it, got, it, it turned into this weird thing of there was literally this headline, which I will never live down, that was meet Haley Quinn, the woman getting interns to unionize. So like shout out to the HuffPost for that, but like that was weird. Um, Cause like I wasn't the woman doing anything. I was like a woman who was part of a group of people that were doing really cool stuff. I read so. that article. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but it's weird. Like, it was weird. Um, I mean, it's great that our campaign got recognition, but like, not letting narratives get totally like co opted like that, not letting it just be about like you or the one person who's like out front with the megaphone, about like really making it clear that no, it was this whole group of people that was doing this thing. Um, so I think, I mean, it's tempting to just be like, yeah, I did do that. I am the woman getting interns to unionize. Look at me. But it's like, um, so I think kind of trying to balance like your ego <laughs> with the need to like actually acknowledge the work that people are doing. So I think that's important work too. Yeah, actually that's a good segue talking about ego um, into what I feel like my biggest mistake has been. And I think a lot of activists too um, is, is not being self-reflective enough and um, really interrogating the the impact of what you're doing. And I think, so starting as, as a teenager, um, I don't think I was entirely at fault for that because I don't think we teach teenagers to be self-reflective. And I think a lot of times when, when really young people are doing good things, we're like, oh my God, you're so cute. And like, <laughs> that's awesome that you're doing that. And it really like feeds into your ego. Yeah. Um, and so, so that's, that's what I was doing when I was an adolescent. It was only until I was in college where I started realizing like, whoa, I actually, um, you know, I have a lot of privilege. Um, and our initial campaign was an internationally focused campaign, which like, I don't think it was very well thought through in some ways, if I'm gonna be completely honest. Um, and so, so that's something that I start realizing as I kind of grew older and I was a young adult in college. Um, but I still also, as, you know, as I was continuing with activism in many ways, I would, I would continue to be blinded by, by my privilege or not really understanding um, the needs of, of 
communities that are different from me um, in terms of like building solidarity. Like I remember one time, um, like I'm not white, but I feel like I went totally white feminist on a friend of mine because she um, uh, she was in a space where it was, it was supposed to be for, for black students only, a safe space for them. And I saw like non-black students there too. So I was like, oh, I wish I like could have gone. Like Keisha Scott's an amazing like professor. I, I like, I'm sad I didn't hear it. She was like, well, that was only like for black students. And I'm like, and I was like offended and I was like, like mad at her, and then I realized later on, like, wow, I, f I f fucked up there. I'm just gonna <laughs> say it. And so I think, I, I mean, I, I feel like that's like an interesting through line that um, that has happened in my history, and and I think that's that's our story. Like, we all have privilege one way or another, and um, I think it's important to own up to, to it and be vulnerable about vulnerable about it, and and just try to do better. And we will never be perfect, but let's just strive for it. So, can I add a couple little things of, of little course advice? You can. Yes. So. You brought up something, something important. When I was at American, I was like, I'm going to solve this like worker rights problem that's been going on for decades, like within next year, and it's going to happen. <laughs> and it did not happen. So one thing I've learned um, is there is an importance to longevity. Mm -hmm. So the you know the people that I think are really successful are not the ones that do something really well one year, two years, but do it for a decade, two, three. So if you love what you're doing and you want to do it in a couple of decades, then you need to make take measures like self care and other things so that you can keep a pace. Mm -hmm. So I actually like, just did a post today. Um, my usual life would basically be do like, I do a red eye, I come to DC, I go straight to work, and then I'll do three events, and like, I'll go to a party and go to sleep at one in the morning. Mm -hmm. Like yesterday, I did a red eye, I went home, I napped for three hours, yeah. I changed, I went to work, and then I went to sleep at 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. So just learning things so that you can do this for the long run. Mm -hmm. Because I did burn out. Like I ended up one week yeah. in bed like with uh, pains. Mm -hmm like uh, aches, and I thought I had like some, di they're like, no, it's actually stress. And I was like, really? Like, it's crazy what the body can do to you when you're under stress. Or like getting help. I never really ever got help when people offered me help. I would say no, 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 no. Cause I was like, I grew up in poverty. Like, you know, I'm just used to like overcoming everything. And sometimes like, like one time someone offered me to pay my bill and I said no. And then the next time I said yes. <laughs> so like, <laughs> it's like offer my cash out. So yeah. so. And then the little last thing I want to say about narrative is that is so true. There was actually an article that was like, meet the intern that got Congress to pay their, their intern. So like, I, I, totally, I, I totally get that we should be more of a group. But I don't feel like it, that's just how like, humans work, mm -hmm. where we sometimes, um, totally random, it's kind of like the, the journalist that was slain mm -hmm. by Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. right? Like 70,000 kids have starved in Yemen. Mm -hmm. No one bats an eye. One journalist dies, which of course is horrible, mm -hmm. and now we're seeing all these things. So. If I were you as an organizer, sometimes you should take that whole notion of like, like people need to, you need to put a, pro, um, a face to the problem. Because that's how people work, whether it's right or not, unfortunately, mm -hmm. that's how it is, so. Okay, well now I'm gonna go throughout my pizza that I have <laughs> for the past two days in my fridge and go buy vegetables, but um, you'll make buy excellent points. Exactly. Or put those vegetables on top of your pizza. <laughs> Also, that's all, also great advice. Okay. Roast them with a lot of oil and garlic. Yeah. <laughs> and on that, I think it's time to open it to questions from all of you. Um, so if you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll bring the microphone to you. Hi. <laughs> I'm a union activist, 40 years or so, and I've had some burnouts, but I made it. I'm the executive vice president now for um, APWU, but um, we're really trying hard to get our young people um, to become activists and get involved in the union, as well as we have many, many people who are seasoned and are going to be leaving. And what are we going to leave you know, the rest of our people there, you know, that are a lot of young people. Um, so we've started some young people's groups, we've got conferences, um, but we're still finding a little problem of trying to get um, uh, the young people more interested and more impassioned about union work. Um, and then we thought, well, maybe we should spread it out and maybe give, g go to the community because we still need the community as well, you know, to support us. So maybe, you know, we should offer them a list of, of opportunities and, and things that we need help with and say, you know, find your niche. What, what is your niche? But I, I really like the point you said about that sometimes you need the person to just say, hey, why don't you try this? 
with me and see how it works. So I guess what I'm looking for is maybe some ideas of, do you think it's better to have uh, young people uh, trying to do a lot of the communicating with the other young people and to get them to inspire young people? Or do you think that um, some of the seasoned people sh should try to help out as well? Or do you feel that that's important? Um, yeah, I'd say it's a little bit of both um, in my experience. Um, I mean, I think it's important that, I mean, definitely in my experience that I had when I was uh, organizing at AFT, um, the organizer from the union that we joined, who I worked with, had been organizing for like 40 years. And it was really important that he said to me, like, you can do this, here's a leaflet, like, here's what you can do. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, a lot of it's really individual too, just like based on how people operate. Um, but I think having seasoned people come in and talk to like a few leaders and then like those leaders can go and talk to people. I mean, the same way how you would like identify leaders in a, a shop or in a, a union environment. Um, I think that's what I would say. I would also say that um, um, unions do a good, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, do, I don't mean this to sound the way it does, but unions do a lot of talking about like how much they need to engage young people without doing, in my experience, like a lot of work of engaging young people. Like if I'm in one more tweet chat about how to engage millennials in the labor <laughs> movement, I'm gonna lose it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like, um, also just like addressing young people, like you are also workers who like have the same concerns that other workers have. Um, but also recognizing that, you know, millennials and young workers have some unique issues like student debt, like the, the gig economy. Um, so I think like being able to mobilize young people around issues that are unique to them, but also being able to have the intergenerational dialogue of like, we're all getting screwed by like this wage plan or like we're all getting screwed by this new company policy. Um, I think both of those things are important in my experience. You said it perfectly, and obviously, like, I don't work at a union. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, basically, what she said is, you know, having at least a couple of like the millennial workers at the table mm -hmm. in one of the committee councils get their buy-in. Like, basically, what she said. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, it's like the buy-in of a few key leaders like goes a long way. And also, maybe also asking them like, what do you guys care about? What are your concerns and everything? And then adding that yeah, into. Or like, like, what do you think that millennials care about? But like, because it's also, I mean, it can be so many different things. Like maybe it's like paid parental leave. Maybe it's time off. Like it can, a lot of issues I found in organizing and also just in my work with unions, it literally did not occur to me. Like until I asked the person on the shop floor, what matters to you? Um, like we do a lot of work with people who work in warehouses and it would never occur to me like some of the safety equipment that they need until you talk to them. Um, so I think that's the same thing with young people. Would you like to add anything? I think you guys said it really well. Okay. <laughs> Another question. Hi. Um, I worked in environmental justice, and I still do, but one thing we had uh, problems with is so we got the community engaged um, in rallies we had going on and the more activist side of the nonprofit that I worked for. but. The thing is we would post on social media and use that as a platform to try and engage other people who were not yet involved in our organization. But that doesn't necessarily prompt people to get out there. Because it's, it, it's not always the chance that you have to, to talk to someone directly. So how can you use social media as a means to actually get people out there if you don't have that one-on-one -on -one opportunity? That's very tough. That's why the best campaigns have both. You have on the ground organizers knocking on doors, going to churches, going to community centers, and then also having social media. I also will say like, and some people may not wanna say this, but as human beings, we're actually very selfish. <laughs> and until we find something that like benefits us sometimes, we're less likely to show up. Um, one of the co-founders of the Black, one of the co-founders of the Black Lives Matter, uh, Matter movement, oh Paul, she had it with her mom that, for years, she did organizing. The mom didn't really see any benefit of it until one of the things that she was organizing impacted her little brother. And then the mom was like, let's do this. So yeah, I, I, I know that's not the best answer, but it, unfortunately, it's both. So it's good to be grounded. Yeah. 
I, I definitely agree with that. I also do want to say that I think it is somewhat possible to build those one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one relationships through um, digital media. So if you are really, really constrained, I think, I think it's possible to create the right conditions. And I think part of that is like, so what we're doing with the Youth Activism Project is we're connecting activists that are spread across the country. And um, particularly, in, particularly in high school, a lot of people feel isolated in, in doing this kind of work. So when you're connecting with people um, that are also doing this, um, that are your age, it, it makes it lessens that isolation. So I think if there's there's a real need to to connect in any way, whether it's face to face or online, I think it's definitely definitely possible to build those relationships. The only thing I would add to that, because um, I think that's a great point, is so um, the work that I did in college was also through the the national organization United Students Against Sweatshops, which I think has a really good model for this of um, like awesome social media engagement, but also they have a network of regional organizers and then they also have a network of activists on each campus. So maybe you get a, a new follower from something or a new comment about um, maybe a worker from a college comments about like, oh yeah, that happened to me. Um, so whoever sees that social media thing can then put that person in touch with an activist on their campus or it can put them in touch with the regional organizer. So I think having those bigger like social media platforms is really helpful to be able to just connect people to the right people to have the one-on-one -on -one conversations with or to even identify the people who you can have the one-on-one -on -one conversations with to identify the people who are organizable. Um, yeah, so that's just one thing I wanted to add to that. Do we have any other questions? Hi, so my question is more related to your like own work, like life at work. So as uh, Haley has mentioned, there's some sexy work or like more inspiring work. You have a rally, you talk with constitu <laughs> constituents and you have really exciting and you are really excited about those work. But the, when you actually co-founded or you, you work for a nonprofit, when you have to wear different hats, there are some, some less sexy work like writing grants and uh, legislative, like administrative work, and maybe sometimes you running out of paper or something like this. And so, so how uh, how do you, uh, how do you usually balance those things? Because actually, sometimes uh, those less sexy work are more like important. For example, your founder just suddenly decided they do not want to fund you, and that's it, that that suddenly become a very huge problem. So how do you like balance those things in your life? Still trying to figure it out. <laughs> I think the sex component of your job should only be like 15%. So if you're trying to like brag and tell everything you're doing and not actually doing the work, that is a problem. And you have some people that do that, that only are like, oh, I got this, I got that. But you're like, but what are the, what's the actual work that you're doing? Um, so like, as I'm saying that, I'm about to brag. So like last week I was named <laughs> as a Forbes 30 under 30, which is great. But like what it doesn't tell you is that I've done like 400 meetings on the Hill, you know, like other parts like that got to that point. Um, and now like I have to step away from that and now hit the hustle. Like while it was Thanksgiving, like while I was eating the, the turkey, I was finishing up a grant application. And then another one, you know, so it's like, and it is good, you know, it is good to be honored and feel like, okay, like reinforce, like I'm doing something right, but it shouldn't be the only reason why you're doing something. Um, because it's only like a momentarily high and then you're kind of back in the same spot. Um, so I, 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 should, I would say it's only, it, should, it should only be about 15%. The rest of it should be like on the ground, hitting it, running it. Um, and I've noticed that no one is sometimes gonna work as hard as the, the person that starts an organization, right? Like it's your baby. Um, I think, a couple of things I would add to that are, so in my day-to-day -day work, I talked about I, I don't really do a lot of sexy work. Um, move the shoulders. Um, but it's about like finding the way that that connects to the larger mission for me. So it's, I'm, you know, writing uh, for, this is a literal example, I did a profile of uh, the changing nature of the grocery industry and uh, the different ways that grocers are using warehouses, which is like one of the least sexy things I can think of. Um, but it is really important for the way that it impacts our membership. Um, so it was helpful for me to, you know, like, 
think about the members who like do work in the warehouses who are going to like, so for example, if you work in a warehouse owned by the grocer, but then the grocer outsources that warehouse, then that affects your job conditions. Um, so for me, it was about connecting um, the work that I do that, uh, that doesn't always feel connected to the movement, like connecting it in my brain to the movement at least. Um, and for me, it also helps anytime I get to go out in the field. So when I get to give a, a presentation to new organizers, when I get to actually meet with our union members, um, to just like put a face to the work that I'm doing, to be like, like there's a hospital that I do a lot of work with in Rhode Island and I know a couple of the nurses there. So like when I do profiles and then I can think of those people and be like, this isn't just an abstract thing. I'm not like just making this graph for no reason. I'm like making it for the nurse that I know that I have a personal relationship with. Um, and then another thing, um, again, coming from United Students Against Sweatshops, USAS, they're great, look them up. Um, they have a really great workshop that they do about activist versus organizer. Um, and they talk about how you know the activist is the person that's always in the protest photo at the front, and the organizer is the person who gets the permit and who like does all the calls to get the people there. Um, so yeah, a lot of organizing work uh, isn't sexy and like isn't the photo opportunity, but you don't get to do those parts without the other parts. And the kind of people who um, come into protests who have like not been at all of the organizing mm. meetings and like start leading chants and taking megaphones. Like organizers hate those people. <laughs> and they change your Facebook profile photo after they got arrested. Yeah. Oh my God, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, they've been at none of the organizing meetings, but like, I got arrested, how sexy. Um, yeah, don't be that person. Um, <laughs> like, it's, it's totally fine and great to go to protests that you did not help organize. Um, but I think it's important to like, kind of figure out where your place is and stuff. Um, so yeah, that dichotomy between organizer and activist. Yeah, I just wanted to reemphasize um, the uh, find ways to stay connected to your mission. And, and for me, that is, um, well, I have the privilege, um, it, usually it's a horror, like being, having many hats, uh, being in a two-person um, organization. But, but the privilege of being executive director at this stage is that I, I'm running the program as well. And I, um, I know that in the future, hopefully, when we grow, we will grow, actually. Not hopefully, we will grow. Um, uh, that I know that I will have less time to do that. But I, I, um, I really will be, I think, adamant in making sure, um, like talking to my board that like, no, I need to have face time with youth activists um, in order to, to be effective in my job as executive director. So um, trying to be in the field as much as possible, I think, is kind of the takeaway there. Do we have a last question? Thank you. Um, so one of you mentioned um, the how you know so many nonprofits and also unions are all for better working conditions, uh, but often they fall short in how they treat their own employees. And I'm curious how you feel the millennial generation is getting rid of the old goats who, um, like me. <laughs> who operate on such a different, um, you know, we, we grew up in a different way. And if you see that a lot of your organizing practices are so sensitive and you're helping to, like when we, when we die off, what is your vision of how nonprofits and unions will really treat, especially people of color, even, even treat like the janitors at the union building? Like, are we moving? Shout out Richard Trumka. <laughs> <laughs> right. Are, are we, do you hope, what, what would be your aspiration for, like, the perfect work setting? Who would like to start? I can start. <laughs> you do it day in, day out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a couple things. Um, I do want to talk about my ideal workplace, but I also just, like, want to reiterate how much of a problem um, current working conditions are in, I mean, I think, at least in my experience, it's more an issue in nonprofits than in unions, but same thing in unions. Um, you see um, employers that are all about collective bargaining rights for uh, people until it's their own staff. Um, you see a lot of nonprofits and unions busting staff unions. Um, you see a lot of them like paying people poverty wages. 
Um, and one of the problems, which I think Carlos does a great job in his work about unpaid internships talking about, is that when you're not paying people enough money to live on, it means that poor people, working class people, don't have access to those jobs. And if you're doing anti-poverty work, you can't only engage people who have never been poor. Um, so I think that's a thing that's really important to talk about. Um, but in terms of ideal work environments, I do think what it looks like is, and I don't necessarily think it's a generational thing so much as it's a power thing, so much as it's that when people have been in management for a long time, um, I think their views start to get warped, senses of loyalty start to get warped, I think. Um, but yeah, I think the ideal workplace looks like you have a thriving staff union that isn't getting busted. Um, you have a contract that's like being respected. Um, and you have you know, retirement plans that are actually equitable for young people as well as the people who have been there forever. Um, I think day to day, that's kind of what it looks like. It's the like, basic dignity and respect in the workplace. Um, and like just simple things like policies that are welcoming and inviting for people, like simple things like having access to a lactation room for new mothers or um, having you know, parental leave that is equal regardless of if you've given birth or not having parental leave that includes adoption. Um, a lot of things that affect everybody, but especially affect young people more as, you know, that's kind of more the options that a lot of us are going with. Um, so I think policies like that are important, but yeah, I thank you for the question. I, I do think it's really important that we talk about how um, uh, organizations don't always live up to their stated mission and to their ideals in terms of the way that they treat their workers. And if you are in a situation where you're working for a union or a nonprofit or a progressive organization um, that is asking you to do more work for less money because it's a hard time for the movement, um, that's not cool. <laughs> um, and you have every right to push back on that. And part of the work is being able to advocate for yourself and knowing your worth. So unionize your workplace if you haven't already. Get, um, get active in your staff union if you have one. Um, Unions are good, is my message yeah. for tonight. I, I just want to quickly jump in because I don't think this is a, a, a point to really end on. But like even like questioning, I don't know much about the union is so messed up and so implicated with capitalism, which I, I personally think is, is something that needs to be questioned very deeply, right? And so this is a kind of a larger question of like how, with, with an ideal sort of workplace in these systems, I also, I wanna, I wanna think about do we need these systems? Do we need new systems? Um, and how, how can we do more like system, system, levels, system level work with not just nonprofits and unions, but also corporations and all the stakeholders that really like feed into each other. It's very interrelated, right? So yeah, that seems <laughs> it's a good point, <laughs> so th this is actually the, the world I'm living in right now. And so in 2017, when we started our initiative of going to on the Hill, like that was our first target. So FYI, like, we do more than the Hill. Like, we also got the DNC to pay their interns. We got the National Organization of Women to pay their interns because they were not in several other nonprofits. And so we started going on the Hill. We realized that there's no data on who pays and who doesn't. It's kind of like diversity numbers. No one wants to talk about them. That's why it's never collected. Or if it is, it's top seeker or whatever. Anyways, so we're like, okay, well, let's collect it. So myself and the co-founder, we did the Senate, then we hired an intern, we paid him, of course, because <laughs> that's kind of important to practice what we preach. And then we crunched the numbers and we found out that in the Senate, 50% uh, of Republicans were offering paid internships and only 24% of Democrats, uh, even though they have the same budgets. And in the, in the House side, it was 9% uh, of Republicans and 3% for Democrats. So we're fully bipartisan uh, because we just, we don't really, it just like pay people, whether you believe in small government or, uh, or big government, but you know, we were released this data, we actually called the experience doesn't pay the bills, why can't you pay their interns? We had media, one uh, interviewer, they actually asked a lot of times, they're like, well, why do more Republicans pay than Democrats? Because mm -hmm. if you pulled people, you would think it'd be Democrats, right? Because they're more aligned to like the labor movement and everything. And I said, you know, this is not scientific, but I think that uh, Democrats are kind of like, oh, well, you're getting paid by knowing that you're making the world a better place. And I would make the assumption that most people that try to enter the nonprofit world and everything, you should be more idealistic, right? Like you are trying to make the world a better place, right? And meanwhile, Republicans are more like, no, we're gonna pay for your work, right? Like, I'm like, yes, I'm happy that we're making the world a better place, but I also need to pay my bills while I'm doing that. 
Um, so the system is extremely exploited. And you're so 100% right. You have all these organizations that are like, let's save Africa, this and this and that, whatever. And it's all white staff. Um, so it's like, if you're serving a community, whether it's Latino, indigenous, queer, and everything, I would say that your staff should reflect at least a semblance of the community that you're serving. Because if not, it's very much a colonizer. Like, we are going to say this, and you're going to do that. Um, so in terms of the ideal workplace, pretty much everything that you said, having more um, women leading, especially women of color, because sometimes, like, like right now, you talk about like politics. Like Black women literally made the midterms happen for Democrats. Yet if you just saw the elections, not one black woman has ever held leadership in the Democratic Party, you know, in the House side. I think that's, it just doesn't make sense. Um, and then the last thing is, you know, patriarchy, all these things, they have been there before you and after you. So like, I don't see it as an old generation. And I also like, there's so much, I think we can learn from both generations, right? Um, so I'm never like, oh, like, let's get the older, because it's, because I even see it sometimes within some of the people in my generation that get to power, they're doing the same things. They're being misogynist, they're being homophobic, this, this, and that. So it, it's gonna continue replicating, um, but yeah. So thank you all for your questions. Do you have any closing remarks that you'd like to make before uh, we end this panel? Young people are not just the future, they're the leaders of today, and we're awesome. <laughs> Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs>